If you would please look at verse number 18 of 2 Samuel 5. If you're with me this morning, say amen. 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 2 Samuel 5, 18. The Philistines also came, spread themselves in the valley of Raphael. Wait a minute, i got to take these off. My diabetes goes right to my eyesight, so i got to put some spectacles on here. You don't want me reading from good news from modern man. No. <laughs> here we go, verse 19. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Uh, wilt thou deliver them in the, mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Belperazim, Bear <laughs> and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon the, mine enemies before me as a breach of water. Remember that breach of water, as he's going to explain it right now. Therefore, he called the name of that place Belperazim. It means hill of breaches. Hill of breaches. If you're like me, I write stuff like that in the margin of my Bible. That's what that name meant because it, uh, it was a battle and, and, uh, and that's what it meant. Look at verse number 21. And there they left their images. This is uh, the Philistines. Left their images. David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again. In other words... This is a second battle in just one passage of Scripture. They came up yet again, spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim, and uh, David inquired of the Lord and said, Thou shalt not, uh, uh, thou shalt not do up, but fetch a compass behind them. That word compass means to set up. So God said, Hey, don't go before them. Stay behind them. Just sit down and listen to this under the mulberry trees, he said. And then he said, And come upon them over against the mulberry tree." And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going, underscore that, I'll talk about in a minute, the sound of a going, in the tops of the mulberry trees, that the Bible says, then thou shalt bestir, underscore that word, bestir, bestir, bestir thyself, for they shall, uh, shall the Lord go out before thee, and smite the host of the Philistines, and David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba, you might want to write the name Gibeon, that's the name of that town, Gibeon, unto the vows that they'll come to Gazer. In other words, it was a complete victory. I mean, from the first battle to the second battle, from Gibeon all the way to Gazer, I mean, it's a wonderful blessing that God just helped David. Did you notice David prayed about everything he did? He had God on his side. And it's no, it's no wonder why the Lord called him a man after his own heart. He inquired of the Lord. If you look at those words of mulberry trees, the phrase, the, and the sound in the mulberry trees. I want to underscore that phrase, lift it as my title, preach about it this morning. The sound in the mulberry trees. Not on or of, but in the mulberry trees. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, bless us now, dear Lord. We've heard the preacher as he talked about coming out of this pandemic. And Lord, we know so many churches that came around their buses that came meet in uh, in-person service. Lord, those poor churches in California that are getting fined for services. Yes. And um, Lord, I just pray you'd help us get back to our senses. Lord, I pray you'd just suppress the evil people in, in these cities and mayors and governors, Lord. And help us, Lord, get back to serving you yes. with a shout in our hearts and minds. And yes. Lord, I pray that you'd just continue to bless this church. Thank you for the pastor. Thank you, Lord, he's allowed me to be in his pulpit on this blessed day called Sunday. I pray you'd help me now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The sound of the mulberry trees. I want to say, if you didn't hear anything else, I want you to understand, and we all know this, don't we, that the Lord is our helper. Amen. The Lord is our helper. Here was the Israelites. They had a thorn in the flesh. It was called the Philistines. All the time of David's leadership, he had a thorn in the flesh. It was called the Philistines. But he always asked the Lord what to do, and God always helped him. But I also want to make it very strong that God's strategy is always divine. In other words, what happened in these two battles, David had nothing to do with it. Other than he just obeyed God. And when he obeyed God, God went out before him, and God helped him win these battles. Yes. You see, he said on this second battle in verse 23, to get behind him and hide in the trees. Yes. That doesn't seem like a good tactic, does it? I mean, when you go to battle, you hit them head on, hit them hard, hit them with all you got. Live or die. But he said, stay behind. 
And I think that's kind of interesting to me because you know, as a preacher, and you know as a Bible reader, that the Philistines always won their battles by attacking from behind. They always won by getting the children and the women and the women and the faint and the straggling. And that's how they win. They hit you from behind. So the Lord might have said to, 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 to David, we're going to get them like they always get everybody else. We're going to hit them from behind. He said, David, you sit down, get your armies to sit down out of the mulberry trees, and you don't move till I tell you to move. Well, what was the signal? The Bible said, well, now here's the sound of a going. The sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees. Now, you underscore that phrase, of a going. And it could mean several things. The Bible doesn't make it clear. The Bible doesn't define it at all. It could have been the sound of angel, angels' feet. I don't know. It could have been the sound of men's feet. The armies were marching. It could have been wind. In the leaves of those trees. It could have been uh, maybe birds. Anybody been around a mulberry tree when it's in full foliage? I mean, birds and coons and everything else are up in the possum. Everything that you can find is up there getting those mulberries. And I don't know, maybe that's what God was doing. Maybe he was using birds to make the sound. I don't know. The Bible doesn't make it clear, but have you ever been in a position where you just listen for the sound? And you knew it was the Lord by His Spirit. Yes. You knew it was God by His Word. Maybe a sermon. Maybe music of a song. But you knew God was the one that was leading and speaking in your heart. And maybe that's what God was doing for Israel. Unusually, God said, just sit still. Don't hit them from the front. Hit them from behind. And listen for the sound of the mulberry, in, the, in the mulberry trees. And uh, so he said uh, to David, when you do this, I'll destroy the Philistines. I'll go before you. And he said, uh, maybe it's the noise of like persons walking in the tops of those trees. I don't know what it was. But he said, I will cause, with, and you can be assured that I will cause uh, uh, Israel to overcome in this battle. Kind of like the old song we used to say, is that footsteps I hear? I don't know. But I know God was leading. And I know God told him, he said, hey, he said, bestir thyself. When you hear that sound, bestir thyself. You look that word bestir up, it means don't flinch about it. Don't second guess it. Move out. It means literally to fall upon them. I mean just to just go after them like you're spoke, like you like you like you're, it's your last battle you'll ever fight. And he said, just make your mind up. Don't vacillate about it. Just go and win this battle. You know, God knows how to help us, doesn't he? Yeah. God knows how to make things happen when we don't know how to have a victory, God can give the victory. And by way of introduction, I have five of these words that begin with P that I've introduced the introduction with. One is, I want you to know, is the perplexing enemy. That was the Philistines. You'll find them in verse 18. The Philistines. They were that perplexing enemy. The second one was the pertinent deliverance. And everything that happened here was related directly to the matter at hand. God didn't mix words. He just told them exactly what was going to happen. And David couldn't have made this up. Only God could have done this. Isn't it wonderful, my friend? Sometimes you get, you get answered prayers, but you know it was God that did it. You had nothing to do with it. Right. Had nothing to do with it. That ball field we've been praying for over 45 years for that ball field. And God brought it to us in stages, but every time God did it. I didn't have to spend a penny for it. God did it. It's an amazing what God can do. Amazing thing. A third thing is the promised victory. Did you notice, as we talked about a while ago, he said that first battle would be like a breach of waters, like a busted the spillway, or like an overflowing dam, or that breaks, or whatever. God said, we'll defeat them, and we'll name this place the breach of waters. The breach of waters. And that's wonderful how God can just overtake. And then in uh, verse 22, you'll find the fourth uh, introduction here, and that is the persistent retaliation. In verse 18, the Bible says the Philistines also came. Do you see that? That's the first battle. In verse 22, the Philistines came up yet again. They came up yet again. Isn't it amazing, my friends, sometimes the battles just keep coming. In your life, trouble just keeps arising. 
And it just seemed like things get harder and harder and harder. But when you let the Lord have His way, yes. things get better. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we don't understand it, but things get better. Just like the pastor taught in Sunday school, sometimes we get bewildered. But God knows how to help us. Then that last five, uh, the fifth P word there, is the purposeful triumph. He said, I don't want you to attack, attack from the front. Don't do that. I don't want you to attack from the front. And he said, when you do what I tell you to hit from behind, you'll win the battle all the way up and down this valley. You'll win this battle for, for good, and it'll help, and, uh, and uh, this enemy will be gone. Well, I've often said that we cannot fully estimate the, the faithfulness that allows victory. You just got to stay at it. And you can't underestimate it, because faithfulness is the way to make things happen. Faithfulness is the way, and when I told somebody this morning, just good to see you again. You've been faithful. A little lady sitting right behind my wife. I said, you've been faithful for many, many, many years. And that impresses me just about more than anything. When somebody just steady, serving the Lord, no matter what, just keep serving God. Just keep doing what Amen. you're supposed to be doing. And we have to wait as if it was the sound of the mulberry trees. So I have three things this morning about this sound. Number one. Uh, we have to read uh, the sound of the mulberry trees are number one, properly deployed. Would you agree with me, my friend, that God did this? Yeah. It was properly deployed. David probably would have made a mess out of it, but he did what God told him to do. And he said he inquired of the Lord, God's mighty hand. I mean, God might have used the wind. We do know wind in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Yes. It was the Holy Spirit that went before them and led them and uh, conquered and we do know it might have been angels. We do know that maybe they went before him. And all through the Bible we see that. But I know one thing. I know God's with us. With his angels, he's with us all the time. Amen. Psalm 34, 7, the Bible says, He encampeth around those that fear him. Yes. Amen. Amen. For when I've been laying on hospital beds, I cling to that Psalm 34, 7. Amen. He encampeth around those that fear him. Yes. Oh, listen to me. I know his angels. Uh, are around us all the time. And you, you know, I've left out that word angels there. Uh, but hey, listen to me, my friend. When we don't need to get in front of the mulberry bush. We need to be watchful. Yeah. Watchful of the world. And the devil. And the flesh. We've got to be watchful. Sometimes we're out front too many times, aren't we? But when trouble comes, we need to request God. Yeah. When trouble comes, it's time to let God have His way. It's time to just let God tell us what to do. And the Bible said the heart of the king and his people are in the hand of the Lord. I want my trouble to be in God's hands. Yeah. I want my confusion to be in God's hands. Yeah. I want my fear to be in God's hands. Have you noticed they put fear in this pandemic into all kinds of people? Uh, like he said, a lot of folks want him to come out of the house. I lost my father this year. And uh, just right before the pandemic, we had a wonderful time of with our family and friends and he was a bus captain for 50 years same bus route same church amen. put that in your faithful bag amen. Of amen faithful and it was a wonderful thing to see hear so many testimonies of folks who rode his bus my secretary has been with me for 26 almost 27 years she got saved off my daddy's bus route yeah, came to church for the first time off my daddy's bus route. Went to Bible college. Got two secretarial degrees. Now she's been with me for 26 years. And that was because of my dad's faithfulness. And it's a wonderful thing. But can I tell you, my friend, that you've got to be with it. You've got to just stay faithful and do what you're supposed to do. That's right. And uh, sometimes this pandemic scares people. I call my wife. She's, oh, excuse me, I call my my mom and we we talk all the time and and for for weeks they were so close they were married 63 years and uh, I said uh, how you doing today mom she couldn't talk without crying she was weak and uh, the miles have separated us because you never know where the Lord's going to put you in the ministry you better take that into into account when God calls you you never know where God's going to put you and for now for many 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 years I've been separated from the love of my parents. And we love each other dearly. But we have to just thank God for phones. Amen. Thank God for that. But I talked with her. And about the time I'd say goodbye, she'd tear up and get soft. And it was hard for me to talk with her because of that. Because I didn't want to make her cry. 
And so one day we was kind of having a light moment, and I said, hey, Mom, I said, uh, have you gotten out any? She goes, oh, no. I said, Mom, you can't get in your car and drive through a fast food joint and get a hamburger or something. She goes, I can. They won't arrest me. They won't give me a ticket. And I said, oh, yeah. And they put so much fear into these people. Yes. It's, a, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, when you're serving the Lord, you can give your fear to Him. Yes. Yes. You can put your fear in the hand of the Lord. And uh, David, may I remind us all that David was a shepherd king. You say, what do you mean by that? David didn't own the people of God. David never owned a flock of sheep. He was over them. He loved them. He fed them. He led them. He took care of them. But they were not his sheep. This church is not our church. It's God's church. Amen. And we're God's people. Amen. We don't belong to the world. Amen. Yeah. We don't belong to man. We belong to God. Yeah. And God's going to help us. God's going to be our sustainer. And see, my friend, the truth is, David knew that those people were God's people. And he inquired upon the Lord. And we need to develop in, in a, a total and complete turning to God and for His guidance and for His help. I know it's hard, but we need to do that. When enemies threaten us, we need to rely on the Word of God for His victory. David stood aside, uh, and God's providence took over and helped him and, and led him. And sometimes our greatest prize is won by the least among us. Now, who would have thought that God would take a shepherd boy and make him a king to overcome these battles and use him to lead Israel through their troubles? Israel's just a small place. Did you know the nation of Israel is about the size of Rhode Island? And yet the whole world's eyes are on Israel. Yeah. I'm proud of our president for making Israel a very prominent place right now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I thank God for that. Well, that's the first point. The sounds of the mulberry in the mulberry trees number one was properly deployed. The second sound I want you to notice is it was properly timed. This sound proved God's timing. God said, don't move until you hear the sound. And then he said, don't disturb yourself. Move out when you hear that sound. What sound was it? I don't know. There's been a lot of times where I just moved out because I knew God wanted me to. Sometimes we don't know all that God's up to. But our obligation ought to be what David's obligation was. You find that in 2 Samuel 5 right here in this chapter in verse number 3 when he said, before the Lord. Everything we do, we need to bring it before the Lord. Yeah. That's right. Everything that we're involved in, we need to bring it before the Lord. Lord, what do you think? Lord, am I doing right? Lord, what is this all about? Lord, can you like, help me and, and can you guide me? We'll never reach our aim unless we first fulfill the, the early promises in our life. Have you ever made God a promise and didn't keep it? We need to get back to those promises. Don't yes. we? We need to ask God to help us in what we've told Him we would do and we haven't done. The lowest occupation sometimes is a preparation for the highest opportunity. Sometimes God will use a janitor before he'll use someone prominent in the church. Amen. Sometimes it's that lowest obligation that becomes an opportunity that that would be something that can be used of God. God took this shepherd boy and made him the king over Israel. Performing duties allows us to have honors, of course. But may I remind us all that one victory is often followed by many. But many victories takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. This church didn't start easy. And sometimes the new birth of a church like this takes more than one lifetime of one preacher. But look what God's done for you. Amen. Look how God has blessed your faith. Look how many people have been saved because you, de you decided we're going to let God use us. And it, it encourages me. When I get around people of faith, it does something to my life and to my heart. Because I know that God's still on the throne. Amen. Amen. David was humble. He was dependent upon God. And he had godly courage. And God works with imperfect people. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Yeah. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners, but God used him. Amen. And uh, sometimes our imperfection restricts God's work. We know that. But I want you to know, my friend, that God's favor are on those that are faithful. God's favor are on those that are faithful. Amen. You look at these folks that are in and out. They're not too blessed of God. 
But you look at the people that are steady with it and they'll brag on Jesus all the time. They'll brag how good God is. But the best among us are imperfect. We just have to keep relying on God. Hey. Keep relying on what He wants us to do. What have we learned so far? The sound of the mulberry trees was properly deployed. Would you agree with that? Yes. The, pro the sound of the, in the mulberry trees was properly timed. Would you agree with that? Yes. But this story uh, reveals number three, my last point, is that the sound of the mulberry trees was properly, properly executed. How did it get executed? It started with David's prayers. Every time he came upon the battle, he inquired of the Lord. He inquired upon the Lord. Your pastor said before we had this revival, we need to pray about it. Amen. Revival is wartime. Prayer is wartime. Sure. But we defeat the enemies and the foes. And we give it to God. And we ask God to help us. People get saved because of prayer. Do you realize, my friend, nothing gets accomplished without prayer? Sure. That's right. Nothing. It's by prayer that we're all here right now. Somebody pray for you to get saved. Did you know that? Sure. And when you do get saved, heaven gets happy about it. Amen. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? It's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> David always prayed. Did you notice after the first battle, they looked around and they saw the enemy put down their images? That's a pretty good battle. We can still scare somebody's God out of them. Amen. Yeah. They put down all their images. So what did David tell them to do? It was wise what he told them. He said, get them and burn them. Get all those images and burn them up. Now, folks, we don't need to be keeping things from the world. We need to get rid of things from the world. Come on. Destroy things in, the, uh, in our life that are evil works in our life. Destroy the works of evil in our life. Yes. David enjoyed success after seasons of struggles and, and seasons of trials. But God's grace was generated through his trust in him. Yes. God answered his prayer. I wonder where these battles would have led if he had to pray. I wonder what these battles would be like if you hadn't put God first place. God ought to get the preeminence in our life. God ought to be first in all that we do. Overcoming difficulties depends on our faithfulness. I hate to, I hate to keep stressing that word, but faithfulness is the key that opens up a million doors yes. in your life. You have to be faithful. God allows His purpose through struggles. Sometimes power proves destruction. Check out Delilah and Samson. That power got him in trouble, didn't it? Check out David and Bathsheba. That power got him in trouble. They had a son or maybe a daughter. The Bible called that no-name child that died. That little infant child. Called it a ewe lamb. You look the word ewe lamb up, it means a female lamb. Maybe it was a little girl that died. We don't know, but God used the analogy of a ewe lamb. But we know one thing, David couldn't eat while that baby suffered until death. He couldn't sleep. But he made that famous quotation that we use at little caskets and little funerals all the time. And that is, I can't bring, her, bring it back, but I can go to where it is someday. Amen. Amen. Oh, you listen to me, my friend. God knows how to work it all out. Yes. But our sin uh, you know, sometimes disallows us to do many things. Mm -hmm. Yes. It causes all kinds of struggles. Yes. Right. I clipped this poem one time. I want you to hear it. Still with me? Say amen. Amen. It's entirely not what you are. You're not what you are when things go your way. Uh, you are, uh, and you're wearing a conqueror's crown. You know what you are when you're exalted and praised. But you are what you are when you're down. You know what you are when applauded by men, your achievements lauded and hailed. You know what you are when success is your life, lot, but you are what you are when you fail. You know what you are on boulevards wide, you are what you are in the alley. You know what you are on Everest Heights, but you are what you are in the valley. You know what you are when softened winds blow, you are what you are in the gale. You know what you are on mountain peaks high, you are what you are in the vale. You know what you are when, uh, uh, because riches abound. Don't tell me how much you can make. But wait till the battles and enemies come. Then show me how much you can take. You know what you are when you started the race. But whether or er you are, you are quit. You know what you are because of talent and charm. The measure is courage and grit. You know what you are when the truth is enjoyed. And uh, truth is enjoyed. And peace is climbed to its height. 
But you are what you are when the battle has begun, for you are what you are in the fight. You know what you are when all goes well and everything goeth by form, but you are what you are when wintertime comes, for you are what you are in the storm. So hang right in there when the going gets tough. Don't waver, don't falter, don't bend. For you're not what you are when the race has begun. But you are what you are in the end. Years ago, not too long ago, we had in West Virginia what they called a duration. And here recently, Iowa and some states had that. It's about a hundred mile an hour sheer wind, they call it. Our state was hit by that wind storm. They called it a, a ground land hurricane. And those winds came across our state. We were in our dining hall. My parents had driven from Texas to be with us. We had all of our staff in the dining hall on a, uh, I believe it was a Friday afternoon. And we saw these black clouds coming in. And we could hear them for several minutes. And the ground began to shake beneath us like an earthquake. And then the winds hit. And trees snapped like they were toothpicks. When it was all said and done, our state, 85% of the whole state of West Virginia was without power. They were not out power for one day or one week or one month. But for weeks and weeks and weeks. Our state was without power. I tell you that because we were going to have a big youth conference on Monday, two days later. Folks were coming from everywhere. We had over 350 people planned to come. We had a chartered jet from California that was going to come with a load of teenagers. We had a tour bus packed and ready to go to come from Texas. And everywhere they were coming from several states abroad. We didn't know what to do as a staff. We asked each other what was our next approach. Should we cancel it? You see, we've had camp when we didn't have buildings. And for this is our 45th anniversary. We've had camp when we didn't have a place to eat, a place to sleep, a place to preach. But because of one little scientist, we couldn't have camp because of a pandemic, they said. <laughs> but during this duration, we asked what to do. We called all the churches, and not a one of them said, we're not coming. They all said, we're coming. As far as California, to the East Coast, they were coming. I said, we're not going to have any power. We have perishable goods that are, won't be here for us. It's going to be rough. It's going to be really toughing it out. But they all said we're coming. To our surprise, the area gas companies, natural gas companies, heard of our dilemma. And they began to bring in generators, big generators, big as automobiles. They would bring them in on double tandems and bring them in and set them up all over our campgrounds. First to turn on the freezers and the coolers in our campgrounds. And then dozens of other things all around. We have over 40 buildings and they had stuff everywhere. Generators everywhere. They couldn't hear each other talk, but we had generators. <laughs> Not only did they bring the generators out, but every morning and every evening, or about midday in the day, they would bring fuel trucks out right. and fill up all of these generators. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing thing. That week we had one of the best weeks of camp you could ever imagine. Amen. I mean, they couldn't even hardly drive up our street for trees being down and devastation everywhere. But it's an amazing thing what God did. Amen. I'm just trying to tell you, my friend, sometimes what to do when you don't know what to do, just give it to God. Amen. And in the midst of a global pandemic, God's people have been the strongest. Amen. Have you noticed? Yes. The most level-headed people in the pandemic has been pastors and their precious people. My, my son pastors a church in Gainesville, Texas. Terry Bradshaw and Tammy Bradshaw, his wife, joined their church. I told him, I said, son, you'll have to compromise to keep him in 
your church? Yeah. He's a, he's a uh, mess. Uh, uh, Anybody knows Terry Bradshaw knows he's a mess. Yeah. And uh, he gets under conviction all the time, calls his son, and, and calls my son and said, Hey, he says, uh, I'm preaching, at, I'm speaking at a college graduation. He said, Can you give me a, a verse? I need a verse. I don't have a verse. He said, I guess I'm bachelor. I don't, I don't have a verse. <laughs> so my son had to give him a verse. Then he said, I want you to speak to my staff every Monday morning. Give them a devotion because I don't know how to do it. He said, okay, all right. And so he gets all the staff from his ranch and everything. And my son talked to him. But my son has two bus routes. You've got to understand these bus routes, you think they'd bring in maybe 50 people. But each bus route, the only two of them, brings in 75 to 85 kids every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they got to run the bus, they'll drop a load of them off and they go back, and drop a load of them off and they go back, and drop a load of them, and that's how they, and they'll pack out a building with just the kids. But they haven't been able to run their buses because of Texas mandates oh. since March. Mm -hmm. It has broken their hearts because they've got a church full of bus workers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they love the bus kids. And he called the other day and said, Dad, they're running the public school buses. I said, that's a good thing. He said, yeah, we're going to wait 30 days, and if they're still running those school buses, we're going to start our buses. Amen. Said, yes, amen. I said, how are you going to do this? He said, well, I think we're going to just bring them in in a Sunday school hour, have them like junior church and Sunday school all at one time, and open them up, get them acclimated back into church, and then we'll just gradually bring them back in. I said, do you, what, what about the state? He says, well, North Texas has kind of lifted all the rules and, and we're just going to, they're having public school, if they can have public school, we can have Sunday school. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Right. I'm just glad that people are getting faith over fear. I'm glad that God's people have determined that we're going to trust God. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, and I'm not making light of a pandemic, but I don't think the numbers prove that this is pandemic or epidemic. I just told a lie. Yeah, <laughs> this thing about child trafficking is yes. a terrible thing. It's a horrible, oh, horrible gosh. thing. My wife's heart leaks in her chest every time she hears. And I'm glad of our president's daughter, who's doing such a good job catching <laughs> all of these child traffickers. But anyway, to make a long story short, I'm just glad God's people decide. You know, when I was a kid, my mom, I had a high fever, had all kinds of problems. She quarantined me. Nowadays, they don't think parents are smart enough to do that. I'm just trying to tell you, just keep doing what your pastor said. This is not a time to do less of what the man of God knows and what God tells the man of God. It's a time to do more of what God tells the man of God for us to do. Just stand, please, everyone. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for letting me be a part of your church service today. How many of the day where your heads are bowed and eyes are closed? Could answer this honestly, Brother Taylor, I'm saved. I know there's been a time and place where I've been saved. Saved and I know it. I'm going to heaven when I die. Thank God I'm saved. Hold it in way up high. You know for sure. You know for sure. Thank you. Put your hands down. I wonder how many would say if God's a big God like you say He is, if He's willing to save me, I'd be willing to trust Him with my eternal soul. Would you pray for me? I need to be born again. I want God to save me that I'll never go to hell. I've never been saved, but I need to be. Would you just slip your hand up quickly? Right now, let me see it. Let me pray for you. Would you do that? All right. Well, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Christians, are you listening? How many would say, Brother Taylor, pray for me today? I want God to help me in all of my struggles, in all of my battles. It's not a time to lose faith. It's a time to gain faith. I want to hear, as it were, the sound of the mulberry trees. I want to bestir myself to serve Him more. And move out in faith, not fear. Would you pray for me? My hand is raised. How about yours? Yes, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Father, thank you for this morning. Bless, I pray, this invitation in Jesus' name. In just a minute, we're going to have the invitation. The pastor will come. If you're here and you don't know Christ, why don't you come with a friend or just get that thing settled today. It'll be the greatest cho uh, choice you ever made in your life to trust Him as your Savior. Maybe you need to follow the Lord in beautiful believers' baptism. Maybe to join the church, whatever it might be. But as you, if you raise your hand as a Christian, let's find a place to kneel today. Ask God to help us in these matters. Pastor, you come.